Blessed to be speaking with you, Stephanie Sison, today. We are working together on the Caribbean Agroforestry Institute. So the Caribbean Agroforestry Institute is for research and for demonstration and education of sustainable agroforestry practices. It is my honor to farm. I don't want a robot revolution to get me out of farming. I love farming. With the price of food going up so much, even just in the last few years, if it keeps going on that trajectory, a lot of people won't be able to afford to feed themselves in their age. So let's plant a whole lot of food. Welcome to another episode of Uncommon Entrepreneurs, where we highlight the top entrepreneurs, investors, and game changers with a hyper global and a hyper local perspective where we take into account the socioeconomic diversity. We're based here in sunny Puerto Rico at the moment. And uh, blessed to be speaking with you, Stephanie Sison, today. And uh, we'll get into your background. We uh, are working together on the Caribbean Agroforestry Institute. Yes, you, we are. you and your uh, partner Dan are making it all happen, and in the field, quite literally. And um, excited to be uh, here today and, and inviting you guys in. I mean, in reality, we all know ninety percent of food in Puerto Rico is imported. And, you know, we're both wanting to be a part of the solution in uh, planting uh, food forests across mm -hmm. the island and inviting people in. And so this, with this conversation, with your experience and knowledge, excited to uh, leave you guys with just some actionable tips about how to support local agriculture and in general, just like uh, what's happening on the island. I mean, you're, you're in the trenches uh, for sure. So welcome to the show. Appreciate you joining, Stephanie. Uh, give us some context to your, your background and where you're coming from and how you made your way to Puerto Rico. Sure. Uh, thanks, Drew. I'm excited to be here today and for your friendship and support of the Caribbean Agroforestry Institute. So this is a, a fun time to get to share with you. Um, my husband and I have been on the island for about four years now. Um, and now we're joined by our new daughter, um, Acacia, who came into the world about a year ago. We um, fell in love with Puerto Rico on a couple of visits here. I was invited to come with a client of mine to help her find farmland. And on the third trip helping her find farmland, um, I was just like, huh, maybe I want to move here. Um, and then started looking for our family as well. Um, I studied permaculture for 22 years, practiced permaculture, taught permaculture and other agroforestry models and uh, visited lots of different tropical climates and lived in different tropical climates. Um, and finding Puerto Rico um, being so wonderful on those trips really, really felt like home to us. Uh, so we decided to, to come down and make it our home. That's great. And so maybe just give us some additional context to what you were working on in Colorado prior sure. with uh, Crimpy, maybe give some context to what that was and uh, then we'll be able to contrast the, the winter north <laughs> with what, what this is. Yeah, no more winters for me. Yeah. I only go back in the summer now. Um, so I was at uh, the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute in Basalt, Colorado, and they're one of the oldest permaculture institutes in the country. Um, 40 or so permaculture courses now, 40 years of permaculture courses um, at 7,200 feet in the Rocky Mountains, where it is very, very cold. And the founder, Jerome, um, grows things like bananas and papayas in uh, off-grid greenhouses um, with a bunch of different fun tech. So you can go to their website and, and check out how that's done. So I have been working with that organization for maybe the past... 15, 16 years, still a board member there, still an instructor there. Um, and really just that was the time that I went full on, full time in every way, uh, permaculture, farming, forestry, and education. Very cool. Got it. And um, I guess, you know, in that experience that must have prepared you for the warmer weather with papaya <laughs> and plantain, you're like, it's much easier to grow it in Puerto Rico. Not in a greenhouse, <laughs> for sure. And I loved being in those tropical greenhouses. I think it was the growing up in Florida, um, having those tropical greenhouses might be the only thing that got me through 16 winters in Colorado. That amount of time without living plants um, is too long for me. 
And so it was always in my heart to return to a more tropical climate um, and excited to do so. I still love Colorado and, and still go back. I teach with the Permaculture Institute. I also teach with the Colorado Mountain College. Um, and then I also work with the communities there with other community projects. We started a seed library where people can interact with uh, garden seeds and learn how to save seeds. We started a public food forest, which is a public park that we turn into an edible um, permaculture food forest and medicinal herb garden that anyone can eat from, use, and engage with. Um, so I still return frequently in the summer to help keep those projects going and lend my support to those. Got it. So give, me, give a little bit more context to that basalt uh, food forest mm -hmm. and so forth, because I think that's there's an opportunity to do something like that here. There's so many public parks on the island that are just like grass and unused mm -hmm. and it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I, I'm originally from Minnesota and Iowa, and people are all over the parks and just hanging out and doing mm -hmm. picnics and all kinds of stuff. And and maybe if there was uh, something like this, I mean, what give us a picture of what that looked like, and you know, if it'd be possible to do something like that here, if somebody were inspired that that heard, uh, how would they do it? Sure. Um, yeah, it's possible to do it here. It's possible to do it anywhere, and we should be doing them all kinds of different places. One of the things um, I, I teach at all all ages, and so for our kids' classes, one of the things we use the park, the edible park for, is this lesson in public spaces are just that, public spaces. And we've come to think of them as government-controlled spaces, but they're really people-controlled spaces. If there's an idea that we have that the community wants for a public space, we should be able to talk to our government and try to get that moving forward if enough people support it. So an edible park is what we did there. It's a half an acre. Um, still has big, wide, grassy pathways and gathering areas and picnic benches and things like that. So you can still gather and use it as a park, but all of the landscaping um, is highlighted and it's all edible and it's all uh, tagged with Latin and common name and uh, directions of how to interact with the park and what the plants are and how to use them and how to eat them. Um, really interesting. A lot of people are very far from their food and we have raspberries there and they're like dripping over the sidewalk, like begging to be eaten, just beautiful, beautiful fat raspberries. And I can't tell you how many times people asked me, um, are the raspberries poisonous? I said, no, like, why would I plant poisonous berries in an edible food park? There's signs everywhere. And they're like, so they're like the store ones? I'm like, yeah, but better. And so there's a writer there that recommended that I take that plastic clamshell that the raspberries are sold in at the store and clamp it on the plant. And so I did that. And so then people, some people got it. They're like, oh, it's just like that raspberry. Okay, I can eat it. And so it's, it, it's an interesting space to interact with food and people and help people understand who are farther from their food systems, the, the connection to it all. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, uh, you know, I grew up in a city my whole life and essentially um, even upon living in Puerto Rico now for five and a half years, you know, mainly in San Juan, the, the metro area, it, you're, you feel so disconnected from your food mm. and, and you don't really realize that, like how it's produced. It just in your, and, and so when I'm hearing you say it, it was probably just almost mind bending for people to be able to kind of like associate like how, you know, it got from, you know, this, you know, in general to, to the you know, their plate. Yeah, how that. it gets to the refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So let's maybe, you know, hit a little bit more on the Caribbean Agroforestry Institute and what you and Dan and we are building with it and give people some context to like uh, maybe classes you've hosted, what you're planning on doing and, um, you know, who, who it's meant to serve and, sure. and all that. Sure. Um, so the Caribbean Agroforestry Institute is... Um, for research and for demonstration and education of sustainable agroforestry practices. And agroforestry um, is a big category. There are many different layers underneath that. Um, but in general, it's agriculture systems that mimic forest ecosystems. And we can take it lots of different ways, but it is about production. It is about food yields, but it's also simultaneously about restoring ecosystem health. Um, 
There are large scale agroforestry projects across the world. These are tried and true systems. And it's actually how most people farmed previous to our industrial farming. It's how most of my neighbors here in Puerto Rico still farm. Most of my neighbors, they don't have huge monocrops of different things. They have lots of different things. They're family farms. They're feeding themselves. They're feeding their neighbors. And like to the 90% of our food being imported, it's true on paper, but it's not true out in the country where I live. All my neighbors produce so much food, but they don't sell it and they don't buy it. So I don't think those numbers are counted. And these agroforestry models and methods are still in practice and alive, but they're they're dwindling. Almost all of my neighbors are in their 70s or 80s and their children are not interested in farming and their grandchildren are certainly not interested in farming and they want to come to the city and they want to have fancy cars and fancy houses and they see agriculture as this thing that's hard or dirty or it doesn't make enough money or or whatever the the reasons are that they've been turned off from it is something I want to help participate with lots of other people who are doing this work to like you say make it sexy again like it is my honor to farm it is my pleasure to farm I don't want a robot revolution to get me out of farming I love farming the the feel of being on the soil, in the soil, hands in the dirt, watching a new flower bloom for the first time and I've never seen it in person, eating a fruit for the first time that I've been waiting for six years and nourishing this plant to get the chance to taste and then share that with someone else. What a gift and honor it is to be in that position. And I think that the earth will share that with lots of people. I think it's in us all. Like we, No matter where we came from, our ancestors were farmers. Our ancestors knew about earth's cycles and they knew how to interact with plants and take care of themselves and feed themselves. It's in here somewhere. And if people just spend enough time in it, they remember. But it's not these like industrial agriculture farms. It's not these oh, thousands of monocropped acres, not a weed in sight, all corn as far as the eye can see, toxic with herbicide, huge noisy tractors, devoid of birds and life and shade and all those things. That doesn't feel good. I would want to get away from that as well. But agroforestry is different. Agroforestry is the magic of a rainforest here in Puerto Rico, except that it's dripping with fruit and medicine. It's organized, yet still has a wild element. It's shady. It's diverse. It's beautiful. It's full of life. And if people get the chance to be immersed in that, I feel that that's the earth will convince them. I don't need to convince them. I just have to help get them there to stand there for a minute and be quiet and turn off their cell phone. And nature will do the rest. Yeah, that's that. Um, I'm, I'm my my stomach is rumbling as you're saying this. I'm, I'm wanting to try some of this uh delicious fruit on a tree. But what um, I'm also recognizing is, you know, how often do we have access to that type of food? And so, um, you know, what, how would you kind of define clean food? What, what kind of, how, like, is in this industrial era of wanting to mass produce in order to make sure that we feed the world, we're kind of missing out because we have to put artificial inputs like glyphosate and other things on maybe give some context to kind of like, you know, differences you've seen through, you know, and what, and what benefit this has. Sure. Um, so a lot of our modern agriculture is highly chemical um, that in, in the nature of itself is toxic to us. It's things that are toxic to plants and animals are also toxic to humans. Um, so there's just the inherent danger of eating those kinds of food. Um, in addition, you know, there's been a lot of press lately about how nut nutritionally devoid our food is. And that's because we don't have living soils. The nutrition is in the plant and is in the soil. And it's about the relationship between the plant and the soil microbiome and the bacteria and the fungi releasing those nutrients, allowing them to go into the plant. And you don't get that in industrial agriculture. You don't. You don't Why is that? Because they use chemical fertilizers. They kill the soil. By over tillage, they kill the soil with chemicals, and then they feed it what they think the plant needs to survive. And technically, you get corn. You get tomatoes. 
they look like a tomato. They kind of taste like a tomato until you've actually had a tomato, and then you're like, this is not a tomato. And, but nutritionally, they're, they're different. They're not making those interactions, and we can only understand so much about soil nutrition and what we can pour in a bottle. Nature is much more complex than that. Um, so we choose to move a different way. And most of our history of agriculture was a different way. The chemical industry has only been a part of this for a very short amount of time. Most of my neighbors, even though a lot of them do use chemicals and have been um, sold this, this bill of promises, um, and now they're kind of locked in from a labor perspective, there's no workers. So how, who are they going to get to manage a farm the way that their grandparents managed a farm? There's no one there to do it. There's no one there to help them. Um, but they remember it. We're not that far away, especially here. In the States, we're a little farther away. But here, almost every farmer I know remembers their father or at least their grandfather farming without any chemicals and farming in a truly ecological way. Um, and so that memory is, is easy to kind of reignite. And, and that information is here. And I've, I've gained so much knowledge from my neighbors telling me what their fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers, how they farmed. And that's one of my first questions is, well, what did your mother and father grow? What did your grandparents grow? How did they grow? And they tell me these beautiful stories. And it's, uh, it's an honor to, to be near people who have so many memories um, of that type of farming. And it's, it's so much more information than I could get from a book. And that when we have these courses, yes, I'm teaching a lot of the curriculum, but I bring in other teachers as well from off island and on island, but also just my neighbors, they wouldn't call themselves teachers. They wouldn't call themselves professionals uh, in agriculture. They just they just do agriculture. That's just part of their culture and their life and their every day. And there's so much knowledge in there. So many seeds, literal seeds that I can hold in my hand of genetics that they've been saving for many generations, but also just seeds of knowledge. Um, and so when you come to courses, we interact as much as we can with as many different teachers and styles as we can within this ecological agroforestry model. That's amazing. What's some of the lessons, I guess, or, or context to like the history that you've learned on like what they're, or what they're telling of how, how we got to this place with 90% food imported versus, and you know, did they give you some context? Um, not directly. They just say that the kids are crazy. Like the kids are crazy. They want to eat this stuff from the store. They don't want to eat the stuff from the farm. They want stuff that's in plastic. And so there's there's a level of frustration, I feel, that my neighbors love farming. They still love it so much. And they work their butts off, but they love it. All day they're out there, 70, 80 years old. My closest neighbor is 84 years old, and he's out there with his machete all day in his farm just doing beautiful work. And, and his there's like a sadness in him that his kids are not interested, that his kids are not there. Um, there's, but then also an excitement that someone young like us moving in is there and like does care and is like overjoyed when they share this, you know, amazing bean seed that they've been saving generation after generation. I have eight different varieties of sweet potato all given to me by different neighbors. And so now they're, and there's no like, you know, commercial name for them. And so I just name them after the people who gave them to me. And it's like, oh no, I have the best sweet potato. This white skinned white sweet potato is the best sweet potato. And it takes this long to grow and you have to plant it like this under the Menguante moon. And there's all of these, um, this beautiful information and exchange and sharing. And then I give them some plant that they've never heard of before and the seed and they're like, I'm gonna grow that. Every time I, I have these really beautiful um, tomatoes that have these stripes down them. And most people that I give them to, generally they'll eat it. But all my neighbors take it and they're like, that's really pretty. And they put the whole thing in their pocket because they're gonna go take it home and save the seeds from it just like I do when they give me one. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you're right, your mentality kind of shifts when you're in that, 
realm because you want to start planting and, and the genetics are the key part to the whole equation. When I can eat one tomato or I can plant a hundred tomato plants that will give me thousands of tomatoes. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, so obviously we're, we're discussing, you know, where we're at at the moment and where, you know, how do we uh, encourage more people to, to get behind this, you know, agricultural renaissance uh, if, if that's what we're calling it, you know, are you finding energy and excitement from people wanting to take classes and wanting to, is there, is there hope and where's the labor going to mm -hmm. come from? Like, how do you uh, talk through kind of that with people? Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of interest. Um, I think I, I went to Fresh Mart the other day and one head of organic cauliflower was $14. It was unbelievable. And I was like, wow, like, Maybe people will get rich farming one day if we keep seeing these food prices going up. So certainly the, the cost of food going up, the instability of the food system, the quality of the food that we're finding now, um, with all of those things being affected, that's, that's certainly bringing some people to the table that hadn't thought about it before or hadn't maybe thought about it before but hadn't prioritized it. And now it's becoming a little bit more important to them because they can't get the kind of quality they want or they can't afford the kind of quality they want. So that's one group of people. Um, it is a little bit getting a little bit like sexier, like cool farmers, cool young farmers. Um, and as that as that kind of PR story changes, that it's not like some uneducated hillbilly that farms that just wants to work hard and you know make no money. As that the the like story of that changes publicly, then we're going to see a lot more people. Um, you know, opening up to the possibility. And then once they, they really, it is hard work. There's no, there's no like shying away from that. It's hard work, but I don't have to pay to go to CrossFit. So it really works out in my favor. Um, hard work is good. And I think people, when they do it, they remember that. And it's, it's for a reason, like you stand back and you look at what you've done and you look how you've participated with this row of plants that you've put in and it, you're tired but you feel good and you feel accomplished and it's something to be very proud of. And then later you're feeding yourself or you're the, the first time you get to give that food to someone and nourish them with it um, is, is such a powerful emotion that I think people really come into that. Um, in addition, there's, there's, you mentioned the labor issue, which is a big, a big problem everywhere, not just here, but certainly here as well. Um, with the rising prices able to support better wages, um, I think we're going to see a shift in that. I think we are seeing a shift in that where people want to pay their workers more to keep them happy or, or coming up with alternate structures that we've talked about before. We've encouraged clients of ours to not think of their farm workers as like hourly workers. How do you keep them a with you for a long time? How do you keep them invested in doing a good job at their um, craft on your property? Well, maybe you profit share with them. Maybe you land share with them. Maybe you give them some kind of incentive that allows greater ownership and participation with what they're doing and the land that they're working. Because farming land is a, is a intimate thing. And you want that. You want someone who feels that closeness to the land. And it isn't just a job they nine to five check in and out of. You want, I go home and if I visited another farm and I planted a tree, I'll return home and I'm thinking about like, oh, I hope it rains so that that tree gets watered in. Or if I'm out of town, I'm like, oh gosh, I, I, I hope the plants are doing okay. And there's, there's, a, there's an intimacy and a relationship there if you allow it to be. And if you're, if you want to hire people, you want them to have that intimacy and relationship. So it has to be more than, you know, $8 an hour, nine to five, you know, you never go anywhere with that, or you never get any further investment. You're just going to get a worker that's going to leave when they get more money. Um, you, we need to come up with strategies that are more collaborative in our workers, like employee, employee, re employer relationships. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, of course we we have conversations about this. I'm glad we're able to do it on camera, and mm -hmm. and you guys are able to listen in to like what some of the theory. But yeah, because how do you essentially create economic incentives to get people excited and energized and so forth? Um, 
And, so, and, and with an agroforestry model, does it require less labor as in comparison to a monoculture? Or how, how would you see that difference? Because you kind of alluded to something earlier. Yes and no. It depends on what you're comparing it against. So if you're comparing it against industrial agriculture, then it requires more labor because you're not um, spraying a bunch of chemicals to get rid of your weeds. You're not... Um, you don't care how you're, you don't need to mulch your soil because you're just pouring liquid fertilizer all over it. You've got a giant tractor that can be run by one person, or you have a fleet of tractors that can be run by computers. So it is not a less labor intensive process to farm this way. But back to like the original point, people need valuable work and they need work that makes them feel good and that they contribute to the world doing. What are we going to do with all these people if we just want to replace them with robots or machines? What are people are going to do? Why can't or, or our opportunity is to reintegrate people on the farm? A farm without people is not a very good farm. That's a pretty long, the birds want people to talk to them. The plants want people to talk to them. That being said, Agroforestry, when you design it well, a lot of your labor comes up front. And as the system matures more into a more of a forest ecosystem, your labor changes more to a uh, pruning, harvesting kind of maintenance level. You're also working in the shade then, which is very pleasant. You have you're also standing upright more instead of bent over so much, which is a much more pleasant process. So you can reduce the labor from like say a traditional organic spinach farm to an agroforestry model and you're going to have less labor you're also going to have higher yields a big point you're going to have less input so you're not buying fertilizer you're not buying compost you're not buying chemicals to put in all the things are generated within the system so you your money is saved that way um, and in addition, the system starts compounding on itself. So you do grow a lot of annuals in the beginning as you have all the light, but as it moves to forest, you have trees, nuts, and they'll come in year after year after year, greater yields as you go down the road. Um, so that's the goal. You spend your time and energy in design and implementation, and then you are just kind of like a radio dial tweaking, watching learning from the system and tweaking and adding and pulling little elements. It takes more um, like day-to-day -day integration of observation. But like for instance, my most productive time on the farm is my morning cup of tea walking around with maybe I have a pruner, maybe I don't, but it's walking and observing and looking at everything and letting the landscape and the environment share with me what it needs. Um, and that's that's some of the most valuable time I spend. That's powerful, interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm also in Iowa, Minnesota, what, what I noticed living there, a lot of combines and equipment that's required is so cost costly that essentially it straps those farmers to mm -hmm. have essentially debt against it. Yeah. And then there's this pressure and kind of this circular requirement for them to stick with that strategy and the, and the price is confusing because there's so many subsidies for big agriculture so big agriculture corn or burgers or whatever looks cheap to the consumer but it's already gotten so many government subsidies that you've paid for it in taxes and then the government has disseminated that money and then it, you're paying less at the table. But then you're also on the backside paying your doctor to help you with your cancer and your diabetes and all your health issues. So it like it looks cheaper, but it's not really cheaper. Yeah, that's an interesting point in perspective and way of you're right. Um, yeah, that kind of comes full circle on that on for sure. So, yeah, I mean, maybe getting into cacao for a moment. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, cacao chocolate uh, is the world would yeah, know it, a product that everybody, for the most part, like coffee consumes, um, goes really well in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working together on a project for some time to essentially use that as a cash crop to essentially interplant still in a regenerative way and an agroforestry way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe speak to 
uh, you know, what makes cacao a good fit for that. And then we can get into kind of maybe some context of what we're working on. Sure. Well, cacao and coffee as well um, are really shade crops. They're understory trees. They're meant to live in a complex ecosystem with trees above them. Um, so they're healthier. They have less disease issues. They have less water requirements, less fertilizer requirements when they're in. And this is true for any plant. So the way to figure out how to make it healthier is figure out what it evolved to be in, what type of environment is it adapted to, and then try your best to recreate that environment. So cacao gives us this opportunity to have a super high value crop as the cash crop that can cash flow the rest of the system. So if someone wants a food producing system because they want to feed their neighbors, they want to feed themselves, they want to you know sell fruit too if they want, that can be secondary because the cacao is the thing that pays the bills mm -hmm. so that then all that other stuff can be maintained and worked and cared for um, and you get all the food from that system. So that's, that's what's really exciting about um, cacao being integrated in these larger ways because cacao as a monocrop doesn't really work that well. Um, we see a lot of disease and a lot of issues in places that do it and a lot of short living cacao trees. Well, cacao can live 50 plus years, but in some of these monocropped other systems, they're not as long living because they succumb to disease and the cacao isn't as good. So shade grown cacao and coffee has kind of gotten a little bit more uh, press lately and real experts and flavor seekers know the difference. Um, so, so it's a, it's a great fit for an ecological agroforestry system. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and it's made in the U S yeah. which is obviously, and then being kind of organic, this is more of like a high end chocolate than a Hershey's bar. It's more like, you know, the $6 bar you'd buy at the grocery store or whatever. Well, and that's where we want to compete. We don't want to compete with Hershey's and places that use slave labor and, you know, don't pay any labor, uh, meaningful wage to their workers and tons of chemicals and huge monocrops that are deforesting rainforests. Like, we, we don't want to compete with that, and we don't have to. We can compete on a different market with more of a, a high-end product. Yeah, and it's something that we're finding. I mean, the, the average, so many people in Puerto Rico have in, that are local have inherited land, mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do with it. I mm -hmm. mean, how often do you drive around the island and just see bare, bare land everywhere that – and maybe give some context to people with like how fertile the land is here versus, you know, Colorado and other places where you've lived. Sure. Um, well, and a lot of it was farmed. Almost every parcel that we've looked at, which we've looked at many, 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 um, even if it looks abandoned right now, it was farmed at some point. So the sugarcane industry was huge here. Um, after that collapsed, a lot of cattle all over the place. So almost every property we've seen is 20 maybe 50 years um, abandoned or or let go. Um, and so it's this like young reestablishing ecosystem and the, the land is healing itself and, and going back towards full forest. And, and here in Puerto Rico, we had more of a hardwood um, system, you know, prior to the sugarcane. And so the forests are trying to do that. And there's so much richness in that just going, they call it going fallow, like just letting a place be, letting it rest for a long period of time. Um, it's recommended in agriculture anyway, but this is, uh, you know, a lot of these places have been left for a very long time. Um, but there's a lot of people who are young people who have moved away from the island or their parents moved away from the island who are now coming back to those family lands with a new idea of getting back on the land and doing farming. Um, one of our students from our permaculture design course that we held two years ago, him and his wife are moving to the island actually in a month or so. Um, and his whole lineage is from Puerto Rico and he grew up in the States, though, and came for that course and met some of his family members that he had never met before um, and just fell in love with this place. And so now he's returning um, and working with some of his family to bring agriculture back like his you know, grandfather did on those properties. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's the kind of testimony. I mean, when they're 
increased momentum. People want to move back when they see opportunity. Mm-hmm. And it's really if they can make a living and it's uh, in just the phase of the world we're in, I think a lot of people listening are going to be able to relate with the idea that, you know, there's wealth is greater than the, the dollars in your bank account or in your, your retirement account. Mm-hmm. If you look at it from a lens of like, you, you own land that's producing clean food and it's producing revenue from agriculture, which is, you know, offsetting, you know, and, and you know, having a surplus mm-hmm. that you're able to add to the economy. Plus you have something for your own, which could be used to, to barter or in a traditional sense, sell on the markets and so forth. Well, and people always have to eat. That's a producing food is, is never, you're never going to, that industry is never going to go away. Like people need to eat food always. And so it's a safe bet that if you have good, delicious food, that you have something that you can, like you said, trade, sell, consume yourself. You have to eat also. Um, So I do consider planting fruit trees part of my retirement plan. I want to be sitting under my macadamia nuts when I'm 80, enjoying the literal fruits of my labors. Um, With the price of food going up so much, even just in the last few years, if it keeps going on that trajectory, a lot of people won't be able to afford to feed themselves in their 80s. So let's plant a whole lot of food. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, like with what you're doing at Kai, it's so exciting because you're essentially uh, training people to be agripreneurs <laughs> is, is, a, is, I think, an applicable term because you do have to, you're, you're taking a risk and you're, you know, starting a business in the form of maybe the person at the start is an intern and works their way up to be managing a farm and then, you know, mm-hmm. eventually has a career path opportunity to own their own farm, if not uh, take over one that they inherited or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think that it's essentially, you know, you're, you're giving them an opportunity to, to get into that profession. Because a lot of people, it seems, either own land or like the idea of, own, you know, having a farm that somebody else is managing for them. And traditionally, that's not been an option or so forth. And so kind of with this, this cacao opportunity that we're not going to get too much more in detail, but obviously there's details below that you can reach out if this appeals, if you own land on the island and or, um, you know, so forth. Because we, we partnered with uh, John Marie Juan Echevarria, who we'll have on another episode to give more context. They call him like the godfather of the Padrino de Cacao mm-hmm. on the island because he worked with the USDA and UPR Maya was to design a specific genetic variety, mm-hmm. which uh, produces um, like a lot of volume, disease resistant, and it's winning international t- taste testing competitions, which are needed to be able to then have a product to sell right. in the market right. to then justify putting in the effort to, to, to do that. And so, you know, with Kai, my, you know, the, the goal is for like it to be workforce development to mm-hmm. teach people a new trade. If you want to kind of like speak to that, and we'll put some of the, the pictures up on the screen of kind of like what you're doing at the school and like what people can expect and so forth uh, like that with uh, just kind of maybe walk us through kind of like what the classes are like and what people could kind of expect and fill in the blanks on, you know, what Kai is and Mm -hmm. and who it uh, appeals to. Sure. Um, So we have a variety of courses. This is a permaculture design certification course. And so that's a two week intensive where people come stay with us, uh, camp. We have all the meals, maybe 10 different instructors over the period. Um, and they will take lecture classes like you just saw, um, as well as some hands-on stuff, but it's a lot of design work. It's, it's how to create, design, manage these different systems. Um, this, you yeah, just flipped through some of them <laughs> as she's going, but yeah. Um, and then uh, this is our current farm that we just, we were on a smaller farm and just got a new one um, maybe six months ago. So these are some uh, rows on contour. That's me walking one of the contour lines with my little baby acacia. This is a new field um, with vetiver grass, which is an amazing um, soil erosion preventer. So we put it on contour to help uh, stabilize slopes. This is my my sweet husband. 
uh, hoe in the fields, who's actually an engineer uh, by trade and does our off-grid solar and water systems. Um, but then every once in a while, I'll make him come and swing the hoe for me. <laughs> Um, so we are an 1101 nonprofit here in Puerto Rico as well as a 501c3 um, and we take donations through Donate PR for people who are looking to help us build out our new facility or sponsor um, students because we do have uh, our tuition for students and a number of spots that are scholarships and we would like to have a lot more of those scholarships and that's something that um, like Green Acres with the Cacao Project and other uh, private clients who are looking to have workforce development are helping to sponsor students so that they can increase that workforce, that trained, knowledgeable, excited workforce to come and work for them. So it fits really well. It's another course, this one of our hands-on sessions, uh, building an earth bag house. So we do um, also work on natural building systems if it's in the permaculture course. Beautiful Chinese cabbage that someone called lettuce earlier. And cabbage was offended, but now we all know it's Chinese cabbage. <laughs> um, in our permaculture course, our students at the end will present a design presentation uh, of their own. And so this is a group of students that were doing their presentation. That's a very small photo. <laughs> uh, and this is our class of 2021, the permaculture certification class that we had. A really amazing group of people from all ages, um, men, women, older folks, younger folks, uh, all together. Some very experienced, some not experienced at all. Um, all coming together to share in this learning and um, take another step towards their path to their own resilience in their life. Um, but some of them landowners, some of them working for people, kind of a really diverse mix of students. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, some you know, visually, you guys can get some context to what you know this is all about. So yeah, just kind of in in wrapping up and all that type of stuff. I mean, we're obviously in an interesting time in the world, and all things considered, uh, you know, Puerto Rico is you know in a transition and so forth. And so, I guess if you were to um, give some context to like what would be helpful how can people get involved look where are there gaps and like even if somebody watching is inspired to like go out to their local farmers market to support you know next week i mean that's success mm -hmm. um you know supporting somebody local you know a farmer that's doing the work um because not everybody's obviously gonna you know take up a hoe and, <laughs> and get into the field but yet um i mean how do people like get behind the movement and and uh maybe what are some resources uh that they could they could do yeah well there's so many ways from the smallest thing of whatever grocery store you're already shopping at if they don't buy their local stuff and if they don't have local stuff go ask the manager to where's their local food where's their organic food what are the farmers that they're supporting you we we choose with our money put your money where your mouth is do you want healthy local resilient farm ecosystems in your community then go find them or request that the people who are providing the food to you interact with them they'll do it they'll do it if they think that the people will buy it i guarantee walmart grocery stores or any other grocery store near you will do it um, that's the easiest thing that you could do tonight. Go to your grocery store and ask for local food and demand it. Um, in addition, you can, if you want to farm, come to a class. If you know someone who wants to farm, send them the information or sponsor them to come to the class if they can't come to the class themselves. Um, people get, can get involved with us by signing up with our newsletter, which is on our website, so people can join um, there and see what we're up to. Um, yeah, give us a call, give us an email. Um, you guys do consultations too. We do. We also have a private business where we help people um, either assess farmland that they are thinking about buying, um, if they have an agricultural goal in mind, or they just want to know what would be possible on that site, um, or current landowners that are looking to develop ecosystems, edible ecosystems of whatever size, everything from urban to um, you know many dozens of acres, um, whether it's for business or for family use, we can, we can help people. And if we can't directly help them, we can probably link them up with someone who will. Um, 
we just are really, really passionate about connecting people with their food and with the land and restoring our land to be the highest quality it can be and thus the food the highest quality it can be and thus the people the highest quality we can be. Yeah, I think you're right. A healthy person has a healthy mind and is able to absorb and to be present and to not be lethargic by eating the wrong type of food and be more active as a result. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's overlooked a lot of times, even though it says organic on the label, but it was shipped essentially. I mean, the, the vitamin content, and mm -hmm. if you because you used to have like an herbal business and the, the vitamin content, would you kind of uh, agree that like it goes down over oh, shipping? Oh yeah, from the second it gets picked, it starts it starts going down. So weeks and weeks wrapped in plastic on some boat or plane somewhere, um, it's, it's less than it was. And, and we need those local farmers and we need to support them right now. Um, they're not gonna be able to survive if we keep giving all of our money to big agriculture. We need to, I guarantee most people, drive around your neighborhood long enough, you'll find someone having a little urban farm business or some kind of farm business or raising some animals or, or whatever you're looking for. Um, really just finding those people and, and asking if you can help them, help support them. Come out and volunteer on their farm. Come out and volunteer on my farm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, it's been a fun interview. I mean, at the end of the day, um, obviously, you know, like we're really doing this to like, you have ex quite a bit of experience doing podcasts, obviously as well on top of like, if this theme is interesting, people please like comment, subscribe, like, and so forth and give us additional context of other people doing good work on the island so that we can interview them at a later point and almost we're planning to do like sub episodes that are focused on regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, all the things, because there's so much we could get into that we don't have time at, at the yeah. moment. And there are, there's amazing work being done on this island. And I only know of part of it, um, but even just that small part to highlight some of those people and, and really explore who they are and why they do what they do, I think is a powerful story to tell. Yeah, exactly. So if this if this is interesting, you like, you know, let us know so that we can just, you know, make more content on this theme and all that type of stuff. Uh, so we'll like, how do people find you? We'll put some links below. What again is uh, the way to find you guys? Sure. Uh, CaribbeanAgroforestry.org. Simple as it comes. Mm -hmm. So great <laughs> to connect. Uh, buy local, call to action. And, uh, but we're uh, grateful that you came in, drove all the way uh, from the other side of the island for this mm -hmm. and uh, more great things to come. Thanks, Drew. Signing off. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yes. <laughs>